Good morning. Welcome to Greece Baptist and John Knox worship today. Okay. okay. He has made me glad in the praise book number 54. We'll take it for twice.
thank you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Today is Sunday, July 16th, the seventh Sunday after Pentecost. We have a guest preacher today. It's our executive minister, Reverend Dr. Sandra Hasenauer, and we're so glad that she's able to join us today. In our tradition, we welcome with respect the Seneca Nation of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, whose ancestral lands the town of Greece and the city of Rochester now occupy. And we encourage every member of our community to learn about the original inhabitants of the land. And in the tradition of John Knox, um, let us stand, turn around and wave at the camera so we can welcome all the people who are coming in on Zoom today. Thank you. And we're so glad each and every one of you is here today. And we will begin with our call to worship. Silence is praise to you, Zion dwelling God. And also obedience. You hear the prayer in it all. We all arrive at your doorstep sooner or later, loaded with guilt. Our sins are too much for us but you get rid of them once and for all. Blessed the guest at home in your place. We expect our fill of good things in your house. All your wonders are on display. Earth tamer, ocean pourer, mountain maker, hill dresser. Oh, visit the earth, ask her to join the dance. Deck her out in spring showers. Fill the river with living water. Paint the wheat fields golden. Drench the plowed fields. Soak the dirt clods with rainfall. Bring her to blossom and fruit. Snow crown the peaks with splendor. Scatter rose petals down your path. Set the hills to dancing. Dress the canyon walls with live sheep. A drape of flax across the valleys. Let them shout and shout and shout. Oh, oh, let them sing. Our opening hymn this morning is number 612, How Firm a Foundation. Please stand in body or in spirit as we praise God together in song. Thank you. 
Our Hebrew scripture this morning is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 55, verses 10 through 13. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress, instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle, and it shall be to the Lord for a memorial for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Amen. So as God sends God's spirit to us, and it does not go back to heaven without being acted upon, I thought I would love to do a celebration of ministries. So for the next two weeks, what I'd like you to do is you all have a little card, and if you don't have one, raise your hand, and someone will bring you one. And if you have something, Harold needs one. And if you don't have something to write with, raise your hand and someone will bring you on. Um, Andy needs a pen or pencil. Anyone else need a card or a pencil? <laughs> so we have two churches here today, and some of you know each other before we started worshiping together. And sometimes it's because you know each other from Habitat or from Crop Walk or some other place that you do ministries. And we do so many ministries together, even though maybe our numbers that actually come to church are not big in the summer. Um, I know that many people do ministries in the church outside of church. What is a ministry? It could be calling people. It could be writing people cards. It could be the grease food shelf. It could be weeding. It could be ushering. It could be volunteering in a school. It could be knitting hats for children. It could be anything you can think of. So while Sally is going to play some hymns for us, I'd like us to all come up after you write on your card what you, just some ministries. You don't have to put your name. And if you know that people are not here because they're homebound, but you know that they do ministries, put those down too. Just put two or three down for yourself and other people and put them in the box. And in a few weeks, we will celebrate them all together in church. Because Sandy has a cold this morning. I'm going to read her scripture for her so she can save her voice for the message. Our scripture this morning is from the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 13, 1 to 9, and 18 to 23. That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on the rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, 
But the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case, a hundredfold, in another 60, and in another 30. Here ends the gospel. And I neglected to tell you, if you are joining us online today, you can put your ministries in the chat. And if you're on the phone and you, or you don't know how to do chat, you can write them on a piece of paper and email them later to Marilyn, or you can mail them to Marilyn at the church. Thank you. Sandy. Good morning, church. I decided it was more important for me to be here this morning than it was for me to panic Cheryl by texting her an hour ago and saying, yeah, not going to make it. So I hope you will bear with me and my voice and my occasional sniffing. I have not done just one COVID test, but I've done a second hand because I still don't trust them. A third, it is not COVID. In the vows of our marriage, we agreed, my husband and I, to love one another in sickness and in health, and that actually does mean sharing sickness, so he's home in bed now this morning. For those of you who don't know me, I am Sandy Hasenauer. It's always such a treat for me to be back here in the sanctuary. I was the associate pastor here back in the mid-90s, which doesn't make many of us feel at all old right now. And in fact, my son was in the toddler room and my daughter was in the crib room and those two rooms now serve as the region offices. And so I am in there during the week and I have told many that I love my office. This is the best office I've ever had in my professional vocational career and I really appreciate that Greece Baptist is partnering with us in that realm. Um, those of you who might remember my daughter as a nine-month-old when I first came here, she is now in her second year of seminary and, in fact, is preaching at the Pride Service at Emmanuel Baptist Church this afternoon. So, yes, she has followed in the family footsteps. So today's focus is on the parable of the sower. You may notice in your bulletin there is a picture at the beginning, that's a Van Gogh painting of the sower at sunset. <coughs> Excuse me. Here's the thing about parables. As one of the scholars that I studied this week in preparation for the sermon said, if you think you know what a parable means on first reading, think again. Parables are meant to be pondered. Parables are meant to have multiple depths of meaning, a lot of entry points for us to enter into as we consider what we are to take away from these stories. Now, the parable of the sower may be a familiar one to folks who have been in church, who have read their Bible, who have studied the words of Jesus. The parable of the sower is a common one for us to explore. One interpretation that we are often taught is that the sower is Jesus Christ and we are the types of field that the seed is scattered upon. We are warned against being the rock, the hard hearts where the seed can't take root at all. <clears throat> we are war warned about the thorns the worries, the distractions, the temptations that can crowd out the seed and not allow it to take root. We are warned against being shallow soil, about being enthusiastic to begin with, but then at the first sign of trouble, we take off. We are rather taught to be the fertile soil, to spend our time in scripture and in prayer and to be part of a church community and do all of those things that would help us be ready to hear 
the seed of the word of God and be ready for it to take root and truly be strong in our lives. All of those interpretations are, of course, legitimate. Those are all things that we can take away from the scripture. But as in all things, it doesn't end there. Those of us who live and have born and been raised in the United States tend to have been taught and take an individualistic view of scripture. We tend to apply it to ourselves, our persons. But the reality is, the scriptures came about through a culture that was very different. It wasn't quite as individualistic as what we are now. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background. Today in farming, in agriculture, and those of us who have home gardens or even just house plants, as I do in my office, we prepare the soil before we plant something so that we know we're giving those seeds the best chance possible to take root and to grow and to bear fruit. We till it, we might have heard of the lasagna method where you lay newspaper and straw and such over it so that it became, becomes really um, fertile soil and we, we dig it up and we get rid of rocks and slugs and all those other things that we tend to find in our soil. We make sure that that soil is ready. However, in ancient times, when agriculture was still a matter of one person standing in a field trying to grow things, generally speaking, what happened was the sower would first scatter the seed and then would till it under. The reverse of what we do now. What that meant was the sower didn't actually always know what kind of ground they were scattering their seed on before they did it. They weren't always assured it was actually going to take root. They spread the seed first, and then they did the work necessary to create the fertile ground for that seed. So let's look at this parable a little differently. What if we are the sower? What if we are the sower? Now this isn't actually that much of a leap. Remember when Jesus died, was crucified, was resurrected, and rose again, and then was ascended into heaven in the book of Acts, we have Jesus telling the disciples, Go ye and make disciples of all nations. Pardon me for reverting to the King James Version. Everybody go and make disciples. That was Jesus saying, I was the sower, now you have the seed. Now you are to be the sowers. What is the seed? Jesus' love, the story of the kingdom of God, the fact that God rules, that's the seed. The seed is the gospel. The first sower was Jesus, and now we are the sower. The seed is now in our hands. Church strategies about church growth often focus on finding where the fertile soil is. We do strategic plans, we do all sorts of focus groups, and we do community assessments to figure out where the fertile soil is. Now, I am a strategist from way back. I love doing that kind of work, and that kind of work is important to a point. I don't remember anything in scripture about Jesus doing a strategic plan. 
I don't remember anything in scripture about Jesus going out and doing community assessments. Jesus simply preached the word. Jesus scattered seed everywhere. This parable, in fact, there are scholars who say it was actually to help the disciples and the early church understand why more people weren't coming. To help them understand why, if this gospel is out there and we feel it so strongly, why aren't more people getting it? Does that sound familiar? And so they're told this parable. Well, here's the reason why. We're scattering the seed, but there's a lot of different kind of soil it's going to fall on. And we don't know what that soil is going to look like. In the 1990s, when I graduated from seminary, again, feeling a little bit old, but we were in the thick of what was called the church growth movement. Everything was out there about if you just do X and Y, you will get Z. It was the beginning of what we also referred to as the worship wars over music. Do we keep singing the old hymns or do we bring drums into the church? Now we may think, weren't we kind of silly because isn't it pretty easy to just blend both? But back then, people were leaving churches in droves the minute something other than an organ showed up in the church. Okay? That was the church growth movement. If you sing the right hymns, if your pastor wear je wears jeans, if you don't all get dressed up for church on a Sunday morning, young people will want to be there. And what we found out was actually young people are a lot more complicated than that. They're not stupid. <laughs> it isn't just, they're not so shallow that they're just looking for a certain type of music, although that does help. There's a lot more that goes on to a person's relationship with a faith community than that. Those types of strategies very much, if you'll forgive me for becoming a, an academic for a moment, there's the modern era. The modern era was roughly 1900 to roughly 19, I'd put it around the 60s or 70s. The modern era was the scientific era. It was the era of industrialism. It was the era of having formulas that worked. To get me on my soapbox, it was the era of Robert's rules. But that's a whole other conversation. But it was, if you just do this and then do that, you will naturally get this fairly mechanistic, but basically it was a way of understanding our world. We forced it into categories that worked for us, and they did work for a time. Then we got into the postmodernist time, and I, when I was doing my doctoral work, started referring to myself as the thoroughly postmodern Millie. Some of you may recognize that reference. Postmodernist says, there are no formulas. We are in a time of limbo, of liminality. We're in a time where we have to kind of take a step back and we need to gather together and think through together what's going on because we don't know anymore. We can't predict things the way we used to be able to. I've now read that we are in the post-postmodern post -post -modern era. I don't know at all what that means. So I would say that what we have recognized is church is different. Society is different. The pandemic simply rushed that along. Many of us point to the pandemic and said, well, things were different before the pandemic and now they're this after the pandemic. That's not actually the case. The case was they were already true before the pandemic. It's just the pandemic said, okay, you think that's true? We're really going to push it into speed now. Okay? We don't actually know what works anymore. I have often referred to wanting to start something in the region that's just sort of growing up a lot of experiments in new faith communities 
as if we are simply throwing spaghetti at a wall and seeing what sticks. Because at this point, we just don't know. Now that could be depressing. I can feel you sitting here saying, well then, what are we supposed to do? We've got this beautiful church. We have two beautiful church buildings represented within this congregation. We have aging congregations. We want to figure out how to grow things. Can't you tell us how to grow things? And I'm sorry. I know I get paid the big bucks. <laughs> but I don't know either. What I do know is what we are assured through both of our passages this morning, the Isaiah passage and this passage from Matthew, that we can trust God to be at work. Isaiah reminds us that God sends the word out and that it comes back abundantly. The parable reminds us that the sower doesn't have to really be worried about the ground. The sower's job is to sow seeds. It is God that will make it abundant. God is still at work. We need to be at work. We need to think of ourselves not just in terms of making ourselves fertile soil, that's important because without that seed being at work in us, we cannot share it with others, but it doesn't stop there. We are called to be the sower. We are called not to make assumptions about the soil that we're seeing. We are called not to look beyond these church walls and say, well, nobody wants us. Nobody wants to hear what we have to say. Nobody wants to be here anymore. We don't know that. We don't know that. And the minute we make an assumption about what type of soil we are meeting or that is out there waiting for us, we are actively obstructing the possibility that God can be at work. How can a seed take root if it has not been scattered? If the seed's not there in the first place, I can guarantee you it will not bear fruit. We are the sower. We also know there's another scripture that reminds us that not only will this seed bear fruit, but the harvest is plentiful. The harvest is plentiful and the laborers are few. Abundance, again and again in scripture, in the parable we're told it takes root a hundredfold, Okay, well, if not 100-fold, 60-fold. Well, even if not 60-fold, it, it, it bears fruit 30-fold. Well, can I tell you, 30-fold is still pretty abundant. There is soil out there waiting for that seed to be sown. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. I actually don't think it's necessarily a bad thing that it's no longer the cultural expectation that people go to church. As the faithful, our jobs were actually way too easy for us for a couple of generations. We are now actually closer to the early church now than what we were 20 years ago. We are closer to living in the world of the ancient church, the world which was first receiving that seed. The world in which those original 12 disciples lived in, the world in which we have the stories from the book of Acts where people were preaching and people were coming to hear them, that's the world we are living in again today. So I would call us to rather 
than worry about, I shouldn't say, rather than bemoaning the people who are no longer sitting in the pews with us that used to be there, we need to be looking at those empty pews as opportunities. Those empty pews signalize the fertile ground that's out there that we don't even know where it is. Those empty seats symbolize the next new people who will be hearing the love of Jesus Christ and will be understanding it as important to their lives. They are the next disciples. We need to be constantly scattering the seed of the love of Jesus Christ everywhere we go. And we can trust that God is the one making it take root and bear fruit. Amen and amen. So since we can all know Jesus, may the peace of the Lord be with you all. Let us share with one another a sign of God's peace.
Please join me as we offer together prayers for all people. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you so much for calling us into your church, for you are the one who calls us into your church. And so we know that you will show us the way to work together to heal the world. Lord, in your mercy. We ask that you also be with all of our leaders because not only are we part of your church, but we live in the world. We ask that you be with the presidents and the governors and all the legislators and the mayors and the supervisors of all the towns and be with those who make decisions on behalf of other people that they may make decisions that bring about your kingdom of justice and joy. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we ask that you be with all those who are sick, those who have physical illness, those who are suffering from drug overdose, from addiction, those who are suffering from mental health, from low self-esteem, from depression, from loneliness. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we ask you to be with those who are mourning loved ones who have recently died, those who will be going on to heaven soon, that you may be with them and their families in the last hours, and that those who have gone on to be with you may draw ever closer to you in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Please join me in the prayer that Jesus taught to all of us, his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. Okay, we chose a hymn that you don't know because we trust you and we know that you can learn it and it's a fun hymn and it's the trees of the field that goes perfectly with the lesson today and so barb is going to play through the entire verse before we sing and we're going to sing it twice so please stand in body or in spirit as we sing together the trees of the field your audition for the choir.
I'm sure you will understand if I just stay back in my little corner following worship and don't move through the congregation greeting you all as I would love to do. I will bring before you now the benediction. Go now with Christ before you to guide you, behind you to encourage you forward, and beside you on the journey. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>